Thank you everyone for making it here today. Um, I've been coming to India since 2001 and this is the first time I had to get out of my car and walk uh, the remainder of the, the time to get here. So um, thanks again. Um, so as Bharat mentioned, um, I do a lot of work with social networks um, and HIV prevention. Um, I'm gonna give kind of a primer on social networks and health because I think network analysis and network approaches to public health um, can be applied across a lot of disease states and conditions. Chronic disease, tuberculosis, other infectious diseases. So, um, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you some network stories. I'm gonna try and keep it a little informal. Um, talk a little bit about what are social networks. It's a very commonly used term. Um, and then how can they be leveraged for public health intervention. And then I'll, I'll tell you some of the projects uh, we're doing in India. I don't know if you can see the, the pointer, but this is patient O. A lot of people think it's patient zero, but it's patient O. And this is the individual who was the first documented case of HIV um, in the United States um, that began the epidemic there. Obviously, HIV was occurring in other places earlier, but um, you can see this was a really useful figure to try and understand how the epidemic was spreading. You can see these are all different nodes, different uh, cities, New York, LA, um, and this is a common approach used by epidemiologists to understand how disease is being transmitted. So there was typhoid Mary, so uh, typhoid, um, you know, ca case contact um, mapping is really how this started. Patient O in 1980, the SARS epidemic had a network component, and then there's swine flu as well in 2009. So let me just give you um, some of the vocabulary we use. So nodes, nodes are people, okay, or actors. Um, so these are the, the circles or the dots that you'll see in network visuals. They can also be places. So you could actually do a network of different uh, community-based organizations and how they're connected to each other. Attributes are the variables that describe nodes. So this can be things like in the United States, race, age, gender, marital status. Here we um, give attributes, uh, religion, and other behaviors. And then ties are the relationships between nodes. Okay, this can be a friendship tie. In HIV, we talk about sex partners and sex ties. And ties have directionality. So um, I might be friends with you know, somebody else, but they may not consider me a friend. So that's a directed tie, right? So I'm friends in, in one direction. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about digital networks, so like in cell phones. So if I have someone in my cell phone contact list, uh, but they don't have me in their contact list, that's a one-way tie. If we both have each other in the contact list, it's uh, a two-way tie. Facebook is another digital network we use. Those are Facebook ties, and because there's no directionality to that, uh, that's called an undirected tie. So once you get all these ties and nodes together, you can start to make, um, you, you can start to measure where people are within the network, and that's what, how we look at different network metrics. So the number of people one is connected to is the network size. Density means um, if the people I'm connected to, if they're all connected to each other, it's a very dense network. Uh, clustering, centralization, core periphery. In uh, HIV epidemics, there's a core group that a lot of the transmission is happening, and it can sometimes spread to the periphery. So these are all the terms that uh, we use. So there are, the approaches on the left side are sort of the uh, analytic approaches we use. There's egocentric networks, which just means um, a personal network of an individual and the people that directly surround them. Sociocentric network is basically, if we took this room of people and we took everyone's name and I passed out the list and you checked whether you knew each person on the list, we could create a network, okay? So that was, that's a roster-based approach and that's how we, we create whole networks, kind of those webs that you see. And then these are all the different applications that networks can be used for. So diffusion of innovation, so if you're into business, um, you know, how organizations operate and how information spreads uh, between units within an organization, that's diffusion of innovation that uses networks. Citation networks, so scholars who, um, you know, uh, have references in their manuscripts and, and, and cite each other, uh, you can create networks that way. Co-authorship patterns, healthcare center organization, healthcare teams, 
et cetera, et cetera. Um, some of the most important ones, though, are, are how do networks affect behavior, okay? So health behavior and health-seeking behavior is important, and that's how we try to intervene uh, within the networks. So here's one of my first network studies, um, which I did uh, in Hyderabad. So I, I've been, I lived in Hyderabad for a couple years uh, during my research fellowship, and I was interested in, in the long-distance truck drivers, right? So we have uh, truck drivers kind of coming up the Andhra coast, um, a lot of transmission uh, happening from you know, their wives at home to truck, I'm sorry, sex workers to truck drivers to their wives at home. And so we wanted to understand the networks and what was really happening. And so here's a, a basic visual. Um, and what you can see here, here's the truck driver in the middle. Um, these are the, his native village. Okay, so these are the close friends in his village. These are other friends that he, he may have. And then these were friends at the parking lot um, when he would arrive there. And so what's important about this is um, we, we start to characterize people based on their um, attributes. So these other friends um, get a triangle, close friends over here are squares, and then we have these sort of diamond shape for the parking lot. You can color things. These are just example colors. So this, these uh, turquoise are the truck drivers, we have farmers, um, and, uh, and students. And this is, you know, if we kept going, we'd have other, um, this is one of his best friends. So you may be wondering, so what, Dr. Schneider, what is, you know, who cares? Like, why, so, so you've mapped it, what does that really tell you? Well, what it tells us is a few things. Um, one of the things is, you can see over here, uh, this is what we call an interlocking pattern. So um, this group over here, uh, the other friends, are connected to the close friends over here. There's a few ties uh, that shared. But we can see this radial pattern over here, these are his truck driver friends at the parking lot. They're not connected to the other groups, okay? And so what's important about this, when we're trying to intervene in, in this man's network, um, and we want to engage his network members, um, we may not be able to engage these people over here. Because if we start engaging them and say, okay, we have to work with you to help this truck driver remain HIV negative, some of that information, because there's connections over here to his village, could flow that way, okay? And so that would make the truck driver vulnerable to um, disclosure of some of his sex behaviors and things that are happening. So um, this is important for determining how the intervention will work. After working with truck drivers, the epidemic started to um, decline in that group, so I moved over to another group that had high rates of HIV and, and continues to in, in India, and it's men who have sex with men. Um, this is a digital communication network, and I'll, I'll get a little more into that uh, shortly. So important in, in networks such as this are things like centrality. Like you can try and, you know, it's, it, this is kind of a mess, you know, the way it looks, but, but certainly you can start to see that you know, there are people on the outskirts um, over here. Um, they're not centrally located, but people here are. So central centrality is a measure of networks. Uh, it's a network structure metric, and it really is a reflection of how important that person is within the network. So every node in the network gets a value. So um, someone can be highly central, less central, and then if they're at the periphery and they're only connected to one person, they're least central. Why is centrality important? This is a, a study done at Harvard where um, Nicholas Christakis was looking at um, influenza outbreaks. And what you can see here is this person A has much more connections, is more centrally located than B, for example. Okay, so they have higher centrality. So why this is important in influenza outbreaks is um, if we're trying to determine, um, trying to, to, to determine when an outbreak is gonna happen, if, we're, if we place sensors on the centrally located people, we may be able to get you know, a couple week jump on understanding when the epidemic is gonna hit. So these, these were kids coming into student health, and so you can see that the time for the epidemic um, to be made aware to public health officials is shifted 
when we look at the centrally located people compared to the general population. So, um, you know, in, app, in, in, in uh, practical implementation, one could think of a Facebook network, for example, and trying to, um, you know, find those people who are centrally located and uh, keeping in contact with them. If they get sick, they start to have a cough, maybe that's uh, something indicating a, a, an influenza outbreak. When he measured this, um, the people who had high in degree, which means they're, most, they're highly central, um, they were um, most more likely to report their symptoms before um, being diagnosed by medical staff, whereas the people who had um, lower uh, centrality uh, were more likely to be diagnosed by medical staff. I'm going to um, go through this relatively quickly. So I wanted to just give you a little bit of an example of how we, how we measure networks, how we collect the data. And so these are ego networks, and basically we, in, in surveys we ask people about their network members, and then we ask them uh, specific questions uh, that characterize them. So the first thing we do is a name generator. So I will come up to, you know, a truck driver and say, you know, can you tell me um, who in your network do you share personal information with? And they'll list a bunch of people, okay? And then I go to the name interpreter, which for each of those individuals, I then ask, how old is that person? What's their education? You know, et cetera, et cetera, all the information I'm interested in. And then what I'll do is I'll say, okay, you've mentioned these people. How are they connected to each other? Okay, so that's the, the alter, alter ties. So then I can start to get at local structure. So in that first figure I showed you of the truck drivers, you know, this truck driver is keeping people separate from each other, okay? So if they are connected to each other across his friends or his, his partners, um, that would be a more dense network, and that impacts uh, communication flow. Here's some examples of questions that people ask for the name generator questions. Um, and then the question is, how many network members should one elicit? So in the United States, the average number of what we call confidants, people you share personal information with, is between two and three, okay? So if I was to go to this room, we actually, we work on a project um, on South Asian immigrants uh, in Chicago and San Francisco, and we ask them how many uh, people do they share personal information with and feel close to, and it is um, around two to three as well. Uh, for that group. So in the U.S., pretty standard two to three, could be family, could be friends, um, things like that. This guy, um, I, I have this uh, guy um, in Italy, what he did is he asked how many people are in your network since you were born, okay? So he, um, he found that there are on average 1,750 people that we can name um, who are in our network since we're born. So you can think about everyone that you've known. When I start to do that, I, I kind of stop around 100. Um, but this is an interview that takes days and, and weeks. So they come back and they'll say, okay, now think about fifth grade. You know, think about junior high, um, et cetera, et cetera. So on average, we, we know about seven, 1,700 people. Um, I say do all the name generators first when you're doing a survey because if I say who, who do you share personal information with and then you give me some names and then I ask questions about them, the participant may get fatigued by getting all those questions. So I like to ask all the people who they are first and then ask questions about each individual. Okay, so what? Um, so um, as you all know, India, um, has an HIV epidemic. It's um, not as bad as it... So I, when I started doing work here, um, I don't know if people were around the HIV epidemic at, at that time. It, this was like 2001 to, you know, 2006. Um, WHO had really estimated there were going to be, you know, millions and millions of people, like 8 million or something like that. Um, but then a collaborator of mine uh, from the Public Health Foundation of India did a really nice population-based study and those estimates went down to 2.5 million, okay? So that was the, the Dandonas um, at the Public Health Foundation of India. And so basically, um, you know, it's a big country, difficult to estimate. 
um, what the epidemic looks like. But we, we basically know that it's not a generalized epidemic. It's not, you know, in the general population. Um, it, it is in the general population, but it's not uh, being transmitted uh, frequently there. But it's more in these concentrated risk groups. So those are the people who inject drugs, female sex workers, men who have sex with men, uh, groups like that. Um, so high rates among MSM. Uh, so I started working with the MSM communities in uh, Hyderabad um, in uh, 2006. Um, they have, uh, it's a heterogeneous group, a lot of, you know, cultural uh, sexual identities based on uh, the sexual activities. Uh, nearly half are married to women, and, uh, and we also found that circumcised men who have sex with men have lower rates of HIV. So this is our survey. This is uh, Sabita in Hyderabad with a client. Um, so I want to just share this a little, little story. So when I was interviewing those truck drivers in Hyderabad and I was asking them, you know, who are your friends, who are your sex partners, they weren't telling me any information, okay? They might say one person, um, but during the interview, their phone was ringing nonstop, right? And so they'd pick up their phone and they'd talk to somebody, and then they'd, you know, they'd say bye, and then I'd be like, okay, so can you tell me who your friends are? And he, he wouldn't say anything. So I, then the phone rang again, and I was like, okay, who is that? Okay, tell me who that person was. Um, and so then I started real, and so maybe he didn't want to share, but maybe he just, it's hard to remember people. And so what we ended up doing is we started downloading people's um, contact lists because we wanted to really understand who, who who were in these networks. So this was the prototype that we developed. Um, uh, we had an engineering student who put this together. And basically we would take the SIM cards of, of men who have sex with men, we would download the contact list, and then we would ask questions about each individual in the contact list. Is this a partner, is this a friend, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what we did was, um, you can imagine, um, men who have sex with men in Hyderabad, you know, we, 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 we go to cruising areas, places where they socialize. And what we did here is each person, we downloaded their SIM card. But you can see with, this is the, this is the, um, the percentage of, I'm sorry, this is the likelihood that with each person that we interview and download their SIM card, that they are already in somebody else's SIM card, okay? So with each person, so say here we started um, the first person, there's really a 0% likelihood that they're in anyone, you know, we haven't interviewed anyone yet. But by the time we get to, let's say, 100, there's a 60% chance that that 100 person that I interview has already been in someone else's SIM card, okay? So this is what we call a redundancy curve. And we plateaued at about 250. Basically, by the 250th person, Every person after that was already in someone else's SIM card. So we had created the network. We'd gotten all the nodes that we needed. So this is what the network looked like. This is an MSM communication network. So there were uh, close to 4,500, uh, there were 4,500 people in it. Um, and from 212 respondents. This person here that I circle, this is the person who we calculated as being the most centrally located in the network. Okay, they were connected to the most people. This person over here, it was the most bridging in the network. This was the person who was connected to two groups who were not connected to each other. Okay, that's important, right? Because if you think of HIV spreading, HIV spreads through bridges, okay? The other reason this is, well, and then his, this is um, where people were located. So you can see people are all over the city. There is not, in the US there tends to be gay neighborhoods uh, but in India, people are located, uh, live, ever, you know, pretty diffusely across the neighborhood. So I'm going to walk you through this one. This is a little complicated, but what's important about these network positions is that individuals may have certain characteristics. So right here, over here, is these are people who have um, high, um, I'm sorry, let's see, they have high uh, betweenness. Um, so these are people that are centrally located, okay? These are people that are a lot of ties coming into them. Over here in this circle, these are people that are high bridging. 
you can see there's some overlap between the bridging and the centrally located people. That's these folk right here. These are people that aren't connected to anybody, or they may on, be on the periphery. And then these are people that were existing, what we call peer educators in the community. Um, and you can see some of these peer educators um, were high centrality, some were high bridging, some were combined, but there were some peer educators who weren't um, popular at all. We found that the bridges ended up being the most innovative people in this network. Okay, and why is that important? That's important because of a lot of work I've started to do with pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is a pill that prevents HIV. Bridges are more likely to adopt pre-exposure prophylaxis. They're more likely to communicate it to their friends, uh, things like that. So we felt it was important to focus on bridges in this uh, population. So interventions that come from networks, there are five types. Um, Collaborative of mine, uh, Tom Valenti, um, has kind of categorized these different types. The change agents are the ones I just kind of mentioned. So a bridge might be a change agent. They may be uh, trained to um, you know, diffuse PrEP or some new prevention modality. They're group-based interventions. So here we have a group. You know, we could um, identify a leader of, you know, in this group, and we could train them uh, to work with everyone in the group. Um, Respondent-driven sampling is a, is a, a network-driven uh, sampling approach to get into hidden populations. And then we could rewire networks, meaning we could take nodes out of the network and see what happens. That re re Rewiring networks is controversial. It's not something we typically do in public health, but it's done in terrorist networks, right? You have a terrorist network, and so if you remove one node, maybe the network will dissolve, you know? So networks are important for other infectious disease elimination programs, um, smallpox, polio. Um, so really, the end of HIV in places like India is going to be a network approach. We're going to identify people newly infected. We're going to engage them and their network members, do whatever prevention we can. And that's the only way um, we're going to eliminate new transmissions um, in this country. So my take home, network analysis is intuitive and makes sense. Um, infectious diseases uh, work through networks. So many, you know, in India, we, we, we did the first network study in India um, in 2001. Um, and, you know, a lot of the training um, that my colleagues have received in India and also, also in the U.S., we, we're, we're by far um, haven't really ex expanded networks as much as they should, is the unit of analysis is the individual. Right, all the statistical software, the traditional EPI software uses the individual's unit of analysis. So we need to move that towards the unit of analysis being either, you know, more than one person. Could be a dyad, could be two people, could be a cluster, that sort of thing. Um, interventions are possible, as I've explained. And then ethical considerations. You know, some of you might be thinking, well, how did, you know, these MSM who are giving you the SIM card, is that even ethical? Um, so a lot of this has to deal with uh, community buy-in and working with communities to get, um, to get buy-in from uh, key leaders. And we can um, keep the information we're collecting very private, confidentially. And so um, if, if um, you know, this is managed by institutional review boards and um, we're able to make sure that there's no breaches of confidentiality. This is my team in Chicago. And I'd like to thank my collaborators here in uh, India, uh, my students and staff, and, and our funders. Is your previous, like, previous, your team, very good. <laughs> yeah, so um, a lot of students, um, postdocs. Uh, here's Aditya, who's going to be speaking next. Um, and then a lot of staff who go out and do, and do the work. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang around a little bit at the end, so um, we can just kind of mingle and, and I, we can do some formal questions uh, after Dithya's talk to both of us, and then uh, we'll both be around to, to talk individually. I think thinking beyond the individual and the connections that an individual lives in and, you know, individuals are embedded in is, is very, very important. Uh, of course, you know, over the last 10 years or so, 
uh, given sort of the proliferation of online social media, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. Uh, people, you know, so it's become much more a front and center issue. But as Dr. Schneider shows, showed, you know, one of the earlier studies happened in 1974 that he uh, mentioned, this is really, you know, we've been embedded in networks ever since we evolved as a species. And, uh, you know, thinking about how to leverage some of the connections we live in is, 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 is important. I think what's become easy or the easier over the last 10 years is sort of, you know, monitor, monitoring this vast source of uh, data that's being generated and, uh, you know, thinking about how we can use these uh, data sets to, to uh, achieve goals of public health. And that's sort of what I'm going to talk about. Um, uh, as uh, Bharat mentioned, I, uh, I I'm consider myself a computational epidemiologist and uh, primarily a network modeler, though I've done uh, modeling and uh, using other sorts of frameworks as well. And I, I really think of myself as sort of being a you know, socio-behavioral uh, scientist. I'm very interested in how uh, you know, people connect with each other and then being able to sort of do computational experiments uh, to, 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 to think about interventions. And that's, that's really going to be the, the, the focus of this talk, how, how we can sort of uh, uh, you know, use, use the computer to, to learn something about how, how to best design interventions. So um, as I said, I'm a computational epidemiologist and a statistician. And for me, the main content areas uh, that I think uh, are, are biology, epidemiology, and behavioral science. And, sort of in the intersection of those three is sort of a very rich variety of questions uh, that, that I uh, work on. Um, primary sets of tools I use are agent-based modeling, network science, and then uh, computational analysis and models that I develop are sort of uh, peppered with various kinds of data sets, in, uh, you know, again, biological, epidemiological, and so on. Um, why, why this emphasis on com computer modeling? Um, partly, uh, if you think about it, uh, you know, there's a number of ethical and logistical challenges in infectious disease research. One cannot just you know, uh, transmit a virus through a population to see what kinds of interventions will work. And so uh, you know, the computer becomes really sort of a, lab a laboratory for us to, to be able to experiment with different things. Um, of course, you know, a computer model is a model. It's not reality. So a lot of thought and effort has to go into making models representative of reality. And that's uh, part, of, uh, part of an ongoing challenge. Uh, one of the benefits of, uh, of doing modeling research is it's, it's very easy to sort of be transparent about what you're doing and make your work re reproducible. Anybody uh, with access to the internet can download anybody else's work if they make it available and then try to recreate the results that they've uh, published or claimed. And then work with different sort of scenarios and sensitivity, conduct sensitivity analyses to, to show how robust the, the conclusions are to you know, variation in findings or input errors and so on. Um, so, you know, I, I came to m modeling from a mathemat mathematics background where, you know, thinking is much more rigorous and, you know, things are either true or not true. And uh, for me, sort of what really stuck was the idea that models are like maps. You know, no, no, no map is completely accurate, but they're good at giving you sort of a general uh, picture. So, for example, you know, my parents live in Mumbai and I was there earlier this week and I'm here in Delhi. Tomorrow, John and I will be in Hyderabad. And so when I sort of think about where I'm going to be over the next few days, you know, this map is extremely useful in sort of giving me a sense of where I will be over the next couple of days. Um, uh, this morning, uh, when I was arriving here, uh, you know, to my hotel, I was looking sort of at a different scale. And finally, uh, at this very location. And so, you see, uh, no single map is, fits all uh, different needs that one has. But, but scaling them appropriately and looking at them at sort of different levels of res resolution can provide a lot of uh, information on, on where we are going. And that's really what a model does. Uh, there is no one single model that would fit every 
uh, purpose, and they're not right. You know, they're, they're not correct in a strict sense. You know, for example, you might think, oh, you know, uh, it takes me 20 minutes to get to, to the Delhi center, but there might be a protest going on, in which case it might take you two hours. And there's no model in the world that can sort of, you know, allow you to sort of generate that information with 100% certainty. But you know that for most of the times that you do make this commute, it takes maybe what you know is true. And so that's, that's how models need to be interpreted. You know, they have caveats and they have to be sort of taken with a grain of salt, but they can be incredibly useful if, if uh, constructed and interpreted uh, meaningfully. So uh, uh, in, in modeling HIV transmission, uh, the sort of the classic framework that, that has emerged is called deterministic compartmental models. Uh, I, for those of you who have maybe dabbled a little bit in ecology, these are sort of derived from the classic predator prey or uh, Lotka Volterra models. And uh, they're built around you know, compartments of individuals interacting with each other. And so there's um, a group of people whom are uninfected, some others that are infected, and there's a rate of transmission between them. Uh, these models have a long history in the literature. Uh, this graph below is from a 1988 paper uh, by uh, May and Anderson uh, from England. And they, this graph below just shows sort of a difference in the reported number of sexual partnerships between homosexual and heterosexual um, couples. And uh, you know, uh, the, mo the type of model they used for this data was a deterministic compartmental model. Uh, to this day, uh, majority of the research that is conducted in HIV transmission modeling uses this paradigm. And uh, while so it's provided a lot of uh, great insight into controlling HIV infections, uh, we can do something a little bit more uh, you know, intelligent and so more involved. And that sort of large framework is called stochastic network models. Stochastic just means probabilistic where you know, solution sets to your models are not predetermined, they actually are generated in a, in a, in a random fashion. And you can look at distributions of, uh, of outcomes and input, uh, and, uh, of outcomes and inputs. Um, now, uh, the challenge with, with working with stochastic network models was that you know, they tend to be computationally quite intensive and the sort of, you know, the, the power to, to, to be able to compute those models was not available until very recently. Um, the network aspect here relates uh, very much to what John was talking about. Uh, John's, you know, one of the things he focused on was um, uh, social networks uh, and, you know, sort of diff diffusion of prevention information across those, uh, uh, across partnerships or, you know, links between people. But equally, you can think about networks as, as a means where the virus itself transmits. And, you know, generating a sexual network then allows us to, to experiment with, with patterns of the transmission of the virus and, and thinking about what interventions might be, uh, might be most uh, uh, efficacious. efficacious to prevent new infections. So, uh, you know, infectious diseases are a, are a rich uh, field of, of, of research, and there are many times types of uh, transmission, there's direct uh, transmission, such as in, in the case of a sexually uh, transmitted disease, such as HIV. There are vector-borne diseases, you know, diseases that are transferred through mosquitoes or ticks and such. Uh, Vehicle-borne, you know, so uh, through contaminated food and water and such and then some combination of all of these. And you know, HIV definitely sort of uh, falls under the direct category, and that's, that's sort of what the focus, focus here is on. <clears throat> now thinking about models, you know, and sort of keeping the analogy of models and maps in mind, uh, infected people uh, and susceptible people are sort of you know, two fundamental conceptual things we we create when we, we think about how, how, how the virus is transmitting. So an infected person is simply somebody that doesn't uh, have HIV and a susceptible, uh, <clears throat> infected person is somebody that has HIV and a susceptible person is someone that doesn't. And then the way the virus would transmit is uh, through contact between them and then you know, transmission once that contact has occurred. For those of you who work with uh, closely in HIV know that you know, 
the, the probability of transmission in any given act, sexual act, is quite low. <coughs> but a lot of transmissions occur because of the frequency of sexual contact or because of the number of partners and so on. I'm trying to uh, come up with what the rate of transmission is uh, accurately uh, or you know, reasonably is, is important. Um, so in, in building a model, the first questions are, how do we define contact? How do we define susceptibility? And how do we define the probability of transmission? And those are all things uh, in, touched upon on the last slide. Uh, now in creating a model, the, the things we do are, you know, you can think about susceptibles, infected, and recovered. This is a more general model than, than an HIV. And for most HIV transmission models, there is no category of recovery. Um, and you can see arrows that point from one uh, box to the other, which means you know, susceptible person gets the virus, becomes infected, moves into the, another category, and then you know, in, in, case, in, in infections where there is recovery, they can then move on to the recovered category. Uh, there's also arrows going out diagonally below, and that you know, lets us think about things like uh, how frequently are people dying? And you know, for many infections, uh, 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 people with, with, with an infection will die at a much faster rate than people who are uninfected. And uh, so that's, that's the death process. And then there's a birth process. You know, people, if they're being born uninfected, then they come into the first, first category. So <clears throat> there's a lot going on in this simple map, even. There's births, there's deaths, and there's uh, you know, moving between different stages of uh, infection. Now, you know, th that, that map itself isn't, isn't enough to, to generate uh, a, a model of any sort of uh, value because, uh, you know, real life infections have a lot more heterogeneity within them, whether it's behavioral, virological, genetic, whatever. And so uh, we can sort of extend that simple idea to, to, um, to many... Uh, uh, compartments and then model uh, transmission of infection. So here you can see, you know, in many heterosexual models in HIV, this is sort of a base map that is considered susceptibility, acute infectivity, chronic infectivity uh, in men, and then the same in women, and then uh, the tra transmission uh, paths from, uh, from infected women to men, uh, to uninfected men, and, and, and the other way around. Um, and then, you know, in, in, in sort of a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a real public health policy type study, we need to be able to uh, figure out how, the, how big these compartments are at the beginning. And that's, that's where uh, public health surveillance is, 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 is very important because uh, that's how we generate estimates of how, well, how many people are there, uh, how many people are infected at the beginning, how many people are susceptible, and so on. And uh, how can we generate uh, some reasonable um, outcomes of how, how quickly people are getting infected and transmitting to others. The third thing that we need to think about is how do we uh, uh, get the rates of flow? So how quickly are people, susceptible people becoming infected, uh, for example? And, uh, and you know, how, how quickly are people coming into the population? How quickly are people leaving the population? And typically we, we, f we find these things out through demographic data that are uh, published through, through uh, censuses. <clears throat> and then, you know, we have sort of all of these different inputs, and we can put them into a computer model and actually look at uh, the number of transmissions per unit time, which is often the, the key uh, parameter of interest, because if your interest is in, is in experimenting with different intervention strategies, you're interested in looking at how many new transmissions occur in various, uh, under various sets of assumptions or under various interventions. <coughs> so, uh, you know, so once we have built the model, then we can make some calculations and, and try to figure out how many of these, uh, how many of these transmissions are occurring in any given unit of time. Now, the big question here is, well, how do you know the values of these parameters? And that's where, uh, uh, you know, surveillance studies come into uh, 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 the uh, picture. Uh, you know, so we use data from empirical studies. Uh, sometimes, you know, for a very important parameter, we might just have one or two studies that we can rely on, and, and the sort of validity of those results is under question. You know, they might have been valid 10 years ago when the study was done, but they might be now. 
they, are, they might not be now. And so in, in that case, again, a model becomes a very important tool because then we can assess the sen sensitivity to that particular assumption or that particular parameter. And then you can you know, talk to c content experts who can sort of you know, give their uh, input about whether they believe the value of that parameter has changed. You know, has it increased, has it decreased? What, uh, you know, what, might, what about it might have changed? And sometimes uh, you know, the answer is simply not clear, both to the modelers and, and, the, uh, and the experts, the field experts. And in that case, we then sort of experiment with a range of these uh, values. And that's, again, another sort of uh, you know, powerful technique that models make, uh, make available to us. So you know, once we have all that theory, we can you know, start uh, running long-term simulations and seeing how the number of susceptibles at any given time is changing. And then uh, you know, we write down, so this is sort of the, the, the compartmental model framework where you know, we use differential equations to, 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 to think about these phenomena. And we can have uh, differential equations that describe the change in the number of susceptibles and the number of infecteds. Uh, <clears throat> and so, you know, once we have uh, computed these uh, quantities, set up the model, then we can start calculating other things of interest, such as prevalence and incidence at any given time. And these are all sort of key parameters to, uh, in terms of uh, intervention studies. Um, and then, you know, oftentimes uh, at, at the conclusion of a modeling study, we end up with a graph that looks somewhat like this, where you have different uh, curves, different prevalence curves that arise for a given situation. And what the modeler knows is what sets of assumptions went into each of these, uh, 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 generating each of these curves. And then what, what, where that helps is it helps in identifying, well, which one of these do we think is actually closest to reality? And this is, again, you know, a place where, uh, where feedback between a modeler and the content expert is, 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 is key. Because you know, is, is reality somewhere between these extremes? Or is it uh, at one of these uh, uh, curves? You know, nobody really knows. And that's why we, 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 we go through this exercise. But what a model lets you do is establish bounds and things. And you can tell how much of an effect something is having approximately. And that's, you know, that, that brings to mind, again, the 20-minute analogy. Yes, most days it takes me 20 minutes to get to the center. You know? So that's, that's how uh, models can be interpreted in this case. And it allows you to establish, well, if nothing major changes, if there is no big protest going on the day that I'm traveling to the center, I could you know, um, make the commute in so much time. So that, that's how models are, uh, are interpreted. Now, you know, recently, so over the last, I don't know, 15 years or so, there's been an increasing uh, push to do more models that capture more, more detail on, on, on behavior, on biology, on demography. And uh, you know, so the compartmental models are built around this idea of average level effects. You know, on average, an infected person will uh, <clears throat> infect a susceptible person with, with this probability. But really, for HIV prevention studies, uh, you know, there are a lot of details. And as they say, the devil is in the details. You know, um, there's a lot of heterogeneity in the number of sexual partners that people has. You know, people have, and you know, some may have only uh, no more than one at any given time. Others may have, you know, three, five, or more than that. And so, the way they affect transmission of the virus is not uniform, statistically speaking. And being able to <coughs> model that heterogeneity, behavioral heterogeneity. Uh, within studies is, is, has been shown to be very important. And uh, you know, doing agent-based network modeling uh, allows us to, to uh, capture these things a little bit more rigorously. So you know, this idea of sexual partnership concurrency uh, has been sort of a key driver of much of this research. And uh, all this uh, uh, means is you know, whether a, a set of partnerships is said to be sequentially monogamous if a new one begins when uh, the previous one is ended. Uh, in, in concurrency, you know, uh, multiple partnerships may overlap, even if it's just two. And that's been shown to have a, a large effect on the epidemic potential. What I mean by that is sort of the, you know, the, the, the chances that the, 
that the, uh, uh, that the virus will infect a significant or substantial chunk of the population. And so what the graph here is showing is, you know, if you notice the graph on the top, the, <clears throat> the, uh, the number of people who are reporting two or three partners is, is increasing very slowly, just by 4%. But you notice that in each of these cases, the, the reach of the virus uh, grows up, goes up exponentially. In the first case, you know, there are all these independent clusters. And you can think if, oh, well, if the virus is in any one of those clusters, it stays constrained in that cluster. But as you, know, you, you increase the connectivity in a graph, uh, even in small chunks, the, the overall reach of the virus quickly, quickly increases. And this is exactly why it is very, very important to, to think about uh, you know, behavioral heterogeneity in the context of, of, of HIV. Uh, you know, I, as I said, I'm a network modeler, and oftentimes generating a map like this is, is a key part of my work, you know, where we can sort of see um, how a, a, a virus will, will transmit and how many people it is likely to, to infect. None of this is, is even possible in the context of a you know, simple uh, compartmental model where we think only in terms of averages and you know, chunks of individuals. <coughs> so you know, a lot of this research came from uh, the StatNet project, which is centered uh, at the University of Washington. Uh, there's a very interesting story as uh, to what led to the development of this. Uh, Dr. Martina Morris, who's a professor of sociology and statistics at Washington, was giving uh, a talk in Uganda in 1992, I think. And you know, she was talking about the various modeling work she's doing. And somebody put their hand up in the audience and asked her, well, how do you represent people with uh, more than one partner in your models? And she said, well, we can't. It's simply too hard. And that person just you know, walked out of the room. And that led her and her collaborator at the time, uh, Dr. Mark Hancock, to start this whole idea of network-based modeling research that, um, that you know, gave us a set of tools to be able to, to generate uh, 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 more realistic models of behavior and biology. Uh, I, for those of you who have an interesting entrance uh, in the University of Chicago, uh, uh, they both went, uh, went to school, uh, uh, did their graduate work uh, at, at the University of Chicago, and uh, a lot of this thinking uh, started there. Uh, Martina actually worked with Dr. Lauman, who's a, a you know, famous sociologist who's done a lot of work in networks, has also been a mentor to uh, my mentor, Dr. John Schneider. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and the tools that they've developed are now really state of the art and are being used uh, in, in, by a number of research groups uh, across, across the world. So uh, agent-based and network modeling are sort of two you know, uh, newer tools, and they both uh, allow us to uh, uh, you know, do more refined computer experiments. They often um, involve writing a lot of your own computer code, but there's a number of commonly used software product, products that you know, people use, including uh, the StatNet and EpiModel pack packages that come out of the University of Washington, and the Repass Suite, uh, for those of you who are interested in modeling, which uh, comes out of a local group at, at Chicago, uh, another set of collaborators uh, of Dr. Schneider and myself. Um, <clears throat> and then you know, we, we sort of simulate these, uh, these models taking into account things like relational dynamics and uh, you know, formation of partnerships, dissolution of partnerships, and collect data on, on, on those things. You know, uh, some of the things uh, that we've heard about are things like generating names. And then you know, we ask people questions about, well, how, how often do you have sex with this person? Do you expect to have sex with this person again? And so on. And that allows us to capture a fair bit of realism in the model, uh, which you know, then feeds into sort of outcomes that we, we get. So, uh, you know, some uh, network modeling projects that I've been involved with uh, in various degrees. Uh, my mentor, uh, Dr. Goodrow at Washington, did this uh, famous set of studies on uh, comparing uh, men who have sex with men in Peru and the United States. Uh, we then followed that up with, uh, you know, work on post-diagnosis behavior change. So, you know, there's been data showing that once somebody gets diagnosed with HIV, they're less likely to have risky sex with other uninfected people. And what does that mean for, uh, for overall HIV transmission? Um, and then, you know, once we know that post-diagnosis behavior change exists, 
what can we do to sort of, uh, from a policy perspective? And the thing uh, that uh, you know, we, we, we discovered was uh, changing sort of the testing patterns of people. You know, if, if riskier people test more frequently, you know, it has a substantial effect on the number of new infections. Now, you know, that seems obvious uh, when you put it that way, but, but for years, the, 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 the type of recommendation that the CDS, CDC has given is, you know, everybody should uh, test once a year. And that, that is e a guideline that's easy to remember, but perhaps doesn't work as well when, you know, the, the level of risk in a population is so heterogeneous. Um, and then, you know, the same sort of ideas and models have been exist extended to, to uh, other uh, contexts, you know, several current couples in Africa, uh, PMTCD, prevention of mother-to-child transmission studies, and then migration and mobility, uh, similar to what uh, Dr. Schneider was talking about in terms of truck drivers, but, you know, there's other types of mobilities where uh, mine workers and such will go away for long periods of time and then come back and, you know, have sexual partners in both places. And again, models are sort of a very important tool that can help uh, inform policy decisions. <clears throat> so, you know, in, in terms of ongoing work, uh, Dr. Steiner and, you know, uh, colleagues at UCLA and UT Houston are and working on uh, the idea of uh, how can we uh, prevent HIV infection amongst people who undergo frequent incarceration. You know, people that uh, are sent to jail often and come back their, their, their communities experience these shocks to their networks where people are going away and coming back. And, uh, you know, obviously that makes them all uh, more susceptible to, to, um, to, uh, to the virus. Yet, when they are incarcerated, they might be able to be given, uh, you know, a certain amount of knowledge about HIV prevention methodologies. And can we sort of uh, leverage that to, to, reduce, to reduce new infections? And then, you know, so th this was all, all, most of what I talked about was, was sexual network analysis. Most of what Dr. Schneider talked about was social network analysis. But really, sort of, you can combine the two things. And that's part of what we are doing with uh, a study in, 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 in Southside Chicago, where we know, you know, we've collected data on the Facebook networks of uh, young black uh, MSM, and we are interested in finding out who those peer change agents are. Uh, Dr. Schneider defined what a peer change agent is. It's somebody who has occupies a central position in the network and is likely to be more innovative and you know, pass on a prevention strategy to their, uh, to their peers. And then uh, you know, the, the Hyderabad, uh, the study in Sikandrabad, which, which he described based on cell phone data. And in both, you know, the idea is to sort of bridge, bridge the gap between doing sort of academic work where we are sort of computing who these peer change agents are and such, but actually inviting them into our clinic, into uh, this, you know, the centers, uh, that are, you know, giving uh, prevention-related information and, you know, uh, training these people to go out and be sort of leaders in their uh, communities. Um, so that's uh, all I have. I uh, thank you all for your attention.